Here's some water. Okay. Yay. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Great. Grand. Okay. Um, I'm Vaughn Scribner. Uh, I'll be the moderator today for this session. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Megan Kate Nelson. Uh, as I have here, Dr. Nelson is the author of multiple books, including the Pulitzer Prize finalist, The Three Cornered War, The Union, the Confederacy, and Native Peoples in the Fight for the West, which came out in 2020 with Scribner. She's also written for acclaimed outlets like the New York Times, The Atlantic, Time Magazine, in addition to regularly appearing in various podcasts, radio, and television interviews. Um, she is, in short, a highly engaged expert who manages to bridge that ever-elusive gap between academic and public-facing scholarship. I'm really happy to welcome her here today and to chat with her about her exciting new book, Saving Yellowstone. And I'd like to introduce her up to the stage now to give a presentation on her book, Saving Yellowstone. Thanks so much for that, Vaughn, and thank you so much for being here um, and for the invitation to be, a, uh, to be a part of this amazing book festival. Um, I am here to talk about Saving Yellowstone, which is my fourth book, um, and the idea for this book really started uh, as I was writing my previous book, but really it has a, a longer sort of origin story than that. Um, you know, in 1982, I went with my family on our first driving vacation uh, through uh, all different parts of the West and then into Canada, and our first stop was Yellowstone. And, um, you know, this was my first engagement with that space, which is such an iconic American landscape. Uh, I was here, as you can see, uh, with my older brother. Uh, we were looking amazing and fashionable in our powder jackets. Uh, any of you who uh, grew up here uh, in the, the Midwest or the, Met the West during the 1980s remember fondly the powder jacket. Um, so we thought that we were uh, really fashionable and amazing here in, in July of 1982. Um, so this was my first encounter with Yellowstone, but it also, as I can look back on my career as a writer and a historian um, interested in landscapes, it really was this formative moment for me um, because I was learning about American history by moving through the environment. Um, you know, this was a time, obviously, before uh, staring at screens on the back of car seats, so I had nothing to do but look out the window, or uh, if I gained the prized uh, shotgun seat, I got to have control of the map, and I got to tell my dad, or my mom, whoever was driving, uh, where we were going, where the next town was, um, and this kind of created in me a lifelong love of maps and mapping and finding myself in the landscape and looking at history kind of through a car window. So ever since, I have um, really been interested in the history of landscapes, particularly of sort of weird landscapes. Uh, my dissertation was about the Okefenokee Swamp in southern Georgia, and my second book was about ruins during the Civil War. Uh, and then I moved on uh, to a study of the desert southwest during the American Civil War, uh, and then of course moved to the geothermal regions on the volcanic basin of Yellowstone. So this is the tie that binds all of my work together. Um, more directly, I was working on Three Cornered War, and I was uh, doing kind of background research on one of the protagonists in that book, and I, I call them protagonists because even though this is a history book and every single person is in fact real, uh, and the, you know, uh, all of my books are very intensively researched, and I have evidence for, for every contention I make in the book, but they are written a little bit more like uh, historical fiction. I take a lot of inspiration from fiction writers and from literature, and so I base these historical stories in the stories of individuals. And so John Clark, who was one of the protagonists in Saving Yellowstone, was the Surveyor General of New Mexico Territory. And so I was doing background research on surveying and really came across uh, this 1871 scientific survey to Yellowstone led by Ferdinand Hayden, uh, who was a scientist explorer at the time. Uh, and I had actually already studied this 
expedition before in graduate school um, in art history. And you'll see why here, here in a second, uh, why I would have studied that in that particular class. Um, but I realized, and this was about 2018, I realized that um, the 150th anniversary of the scientific expedition was coming up in 2021, um, and so was the 150th anniversary of the Yellowstone Act, which was a direct result of the expedition. Um, came six months later, uh, Ulysses S. Grant signed the Yellowstone Act, creating the first national park in the world uh, in March of uh, 1872. So, you know, when you're, when you're a, a writer out there, kind of, uh, you know, living the writing life and uh, trying to make a living as a writer, uh, anniversaries are a very persuasive uh, sort of marketing tool for agents and editors. They like um, to, to have that sort of extra punch that people are going to be, you know, sort of naturally interested in this moment because there are already going to be celebrations and people will already be talking about uh, Yellowstone in 2022. So we planned um, to release the book on March 1st, 2022, and uh, we did in fact do that. Um, I was, as I was thinking about this idea, I was like, you know, a lot of people who've written about Hayden, a lot of people have written about Yellowstone, most of the time they're writing in the history of conservation, um, the history of preservation, and that kind of context. And I really started thinking about, you know, two major questions. One was, why save Yellowstone? Um, there were other places that had already been kind of taken out of private use and development and preserved for the benefit of the people. Um, first, in 1832, right here in Arkansas, uh, Hot Springs was a reservation already at that point. Um, also, Yosemite had been made a state park uh, in 1864. There was Niagara Falls, People were already uh, exploring Grand Canyon. So why Yellowstone? Why this place that was actually unsettling to a lot of people? Um, why would that be the place that the US Congress would choose uh, to create the first national park? And then why in 1871-72? This is right in the middle of Reconstruction when the US Congress is, is really focused on bringing the southern states back into the Union they are dealing with the rise of the KKK um, and the attempts of white Southerners to take um, the 14th and 15th Amendment rights, the newly gained rights, um, away from black Southerners. So they're, they have a lot to deal with in the South. So why are they doing this? Why are they giving Ferdinand Hayden $40,000 to explore Yellowstone, which in today's money would be about a million dollars? Why are they funding that expedition? And why are they then passing this kind of landmark legislation uh, these were my driving questions uh, going into the project, um, and I, as I was researching, I decided that there were kind of three main figures who became really interesting and really uh, important in bringing Yellowstone into the national conversation uh, and bringing about the Yellowstone Act. The first of these. Uh, was Ferdinand Hayden, um, a scientist and explorer. Uh, Hayden was a pretty interesting guy. He was born in Massachusetts, the child of divorce. Um, he grew up in great poverty. So he was not one of these kind of gentleman scientists in the, in the Thomas Jefferson mode. He was pretty hard scrabble. He was very ambitious and kind of obnoxious. Uh, and this made him appeal to me, of course, because I like to uh, write about people who are kind of messy. Right, um, because we're all a little messy, right? Uh, so I, I found him really fascinating. He, he built his own career. He started out as a fossil hunter, which meant that he would go and collect fossils on these trips. He loved being in the field and being outside. And then he would sell these specimens to other scientists. Uh, but he decided that he couldn't make enough money <laughs> in that endeavor. Uh, and so he uh, decided that he wanted to be um, a government surveyor. And this was a tradition that started with Lewis and Clark in 1804, uh, with the government sending out usually military men, but increasingly civilian scientists to lead these expeditions into places uh, across the United States where they would map it, 
record climate details, um, flora and fauna, and really figure out what America could do with this land. Could they farm it? Could they ranch it? Could they mine it? What could they do with it? Um, so Hayden built this career for himself, and by 1867, he was the head of his own survey. And what that meant is that every year he would go to Congress in kind of January, February. He would lobby them for money to take a trip. Uh, then he would get that money, usually, organize his survey, set out into um, usually the West to do the survey between about May and September. Then he'd come back, he would write a report for the government, because whenever the government gives you money or something like this, you have to write a report of your findings. And these were reports hundreds of pages long. And he wrote them in about two months and then submitted them to the US government and then started lobbying again for the next season. So he was hustling the entire time and he was in competition uh, with several other uh, explorers in the field, including John Wesley Powell and Clarence King, um, both of whom he hated uh, with a passion. Um, Hayden, though, had, he had several skills that, led, that really made him a really good leader of expeditions. And this is a photograph of him in camp. You can see he's kind of sitting on a box and writing in his journal. Um, he was a very effective manager of the expedition. He let his scientists kind of form their own collecting groups and go their own way. Um, but he was pretty strict about how they would then label and pack and ship their specimens uh, back to Washington, D.C., to the Smithsonian. Um, he, but uh, you know, everyone really respected him. He brought together a really interesting group of people, scientists, um, and then also a group of guys he called the political boys, uh, who were all the sons of Republican congressmen who had given him money. Um, and he knew he needed to be on their good side, uh, but he also made it clear to the political boys that they had to work. And if they didn't work, they were out, right? Uh, he hired a lot of laborers um, and packers and guides uh, who he trusted, um, got a lot of military horses from bases, um, from garrisons and forts across the West. Um, but the person that he valued most and the person he hired first uh, was Potato John Raymond, uh, the cook of the expedition. Um, but he also very much valued visual images. He understood, he was a very good writer, and he was one of the first to actually write in that, that popular science mode uh, that we're more familiar with in kind of popular magazines now. He was one of the first to write kind of science as travelogue uh, and really you know, kind of get some pretty hardcore scientific detail into these accounts, um, but give it to you in a kind of adventure or travel story. Um, but he knew how important visual images were to conveying um, a couple of things. First, what was actually there in the West, um, the grandeur of it, and then also, you know, visual images provided evidence that they actually went. They actually did uh, the work and they went to these places. And for Yellowstone, this was really important because in 1871, this was one of the last unmapped places on the continent. And it was really a land of rumor. People didn't really know what was going on there. Um, so, and it seemed incredible, right? Cliffs made of glass, water exploding from the ground, you know, mud volcanoes. It seemed a little insane. And so he needed documentation. So um, two of his other kind of most important members of the expedition, um, in, addition to, in addition to Potato John, um, were two artists. The first was William Henry Jackson. Uh, a photographer. Uh, Hayden had worked uh, with him before in the year before in his 1870 expedition to Wyoming. And Jackson had already developed, he'd got a big commission as a photographer for the Union Pacific Railroad. So he already had established himself as one of the foremost photographers in the nation. Um, and here's just two of the, the images that he took. He took a lot of images along the way, along the march. Uh, just to show, again, their progress and to document what was actually there. Butler's Ranch was this kind of way station. It was the last stop before the expedition jumped off into Yellowstone Basin. Uh, and then this classic photo of what they called the White Mountain, uh, which is now called Mammoth Hot Springs. Um, and that's actually Thomas Moran, the painter, uh, who he sent out there onto the structure uh, to provide you, the viewer, uh, with a sense of scale. Um, and endangering the life of one of our most 
valued and revered landscape painters, right? Um, you cannot do this now, obviously it's incredibly dangerous, you're not allowed to go out and stand on the structure, but these guys uh, were the first Americans to actually see Mammoth Hot Springs and to document it, so they were crawling all over it. They were taking water specimens, and Hayden was breaking off pieces of the structure and putting them in his bag to send back to the Smithsonian. Uh, but Jackson's photographs were really important, and when they got back to D.C. and they were lobbying for the Yellowstone Act, Hayden actually chose several of Jackson's photographs to put in an exhibit in the rotunda uh, to give these congressmen a sense of what was actually there in Yellowstone. The other artist uh, was Thomas Moran, uh, who joined the expedition uh, at the request of one of the other protagonists in the book, uh, Jay Cook. Uh, an investment banker who was interested in running the Northern Pacific Railroad uh, near Yellowstone. Um, so he did a lot of watercolor sketches uh, in situ, uh, but then he started working. He was really inspired by the Lower Falls and the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, and he started to work. Uh, he actually left the expedition a little bit early because he was so excited to go home to his studio uh, in New Jersey and start to work on what he called his big picture. Um, and his images, he also, these watercolors appeared in that rotunda exhibit uh, to show congressmen um, the, the nature really of Yellowstone and why it should be saved. Um, and just to, to give you a sense, I, I wrote this book um, almost entirely during the pandemic. So I, I wrote a book about exploration and movement through space from my own living room, which was deeply <laughs> ironic and very disturbing um, to someone like me who really values uh, being there out in the landscape. And um, so I only had one week of research in an archive for this project um, at the National Archives, uh, but I was able to look at all of the expedition records um, on microfilm that Hayden had collected. This was also part of his charge. He had to actually turn over all of this documentation to the federal government, and it's all held by the National Archives um, in a record group that is devoted to government expeditions. So this is, a, this is a letter that Thomas Moran wrote to Hayden um, in March of 1872. So this is after the Yellowstone Act was passed and he's working on his big picture. And what I love about looking at documents themselves instead of just transcriptions is that you find little details in them that are just really charming. So in this letter, he's asking Hayden to send him a photograph of himself um, because he wants to include Hayden in the big picture. Um, and, and this was co quite common to include expedition members in these visual images. And so if you can see kind of halfway down in the letter on the right side, uh, Moran is saying, uh, I, you know, I want you to send me this photograph of, of you, like, you know, a portrait of you, um, and it should be about this size. And so he sketches Hayden. So this is Hayden in his hat, his beard. He's got kind of one hat and his jacket. Um, and I just thought that was this really lovely kind of moment with these, you know, two men writing to each other and this artist kind of asking for help from Hayden. He also wanted him to see the big picture because he wanted to make sure he had most of the geological detail correct. Um, because the, he wanted the painting to be effective aesthetically, but he also wanted it to be in part true. Um, so this is the big picture uh, in real life. It's not quite this big, but it is uh, 8 feet by 12 feet, which is large. Um, and it has a ton of detail in it. Um, and most critics really, really loved uh, this image when it was shown in New York in May of 1872. They thought the color was amazing. Uh, and if you've been to Yellowstone and you've seen the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, you know this is it is yellow like this. It's got that kind of... Uh, yellow and kind of dark red cast to it because of the volcanic nature of the rocks in this region. Um, and I, I took out a detail here so you could see Hayden did end up in the painting. He's there in the foreground on a prospect uh, pointing out into the distance at the lower falls of the Yellowstone. Um, but he's not facing us, right? So this portrait, the, the photograph that Hayden uh, presumably sent him uh, was not useful at all. Um, so he painted him from the back, and he also included uh, a native guide in this image. Uh, and there was no native guide on the Hayden Expedition.
This is a completely made up figure. Uh, this is part of the whole context of American landscape art. A lot of landscape images had uh, just a single native person in the foreground uh, meant to represent uh, what was known as, uh, quote unquote, the vanishing Indian. Um, so this was meant to be a person who was, uh, ha he had a relationship with Hayden, he was welcoming him to Yellowstone, and basically offering it up uh, to Hayden and to Americans and to white settlers. Um, this, of course, was not the case. Uh, as I show in the book. Um, so the, the second protagonist in the book is Jay Cook, uh, who did fund uh, Thomas Moran's trip and bought uh, several, well, actually, in exchange for that, took several of those watercolors, and they were in his possession uh, until 1873. Now, Jay Cook uh, was pretty famous in America at this point. He had made all of his money during the Civil War, selling U.S. war bonds. Because, um, you know, it costs money to fight a war, and so he took control. He, was, he had an investment bank. He had, from a very young age, been very good at math, started working as a clerk in a bank when he was just 14, uh, had an intuitive sense of business, and had this investment bank uh, through which he raised money for the U.S. government by selling bonds uh, to Northerners. He took a commission on those bonds, of course. So in addition to feeling quite patriotic and feeling like he was supporting the Union cause, he also made millions of dollars. Um, so a win-win, right, in his view. Uh, and so Cook, uh, he uh, was looking for another similar type of project uh, during Reconstruction in the years after the war, and he hit upon the Northern Pacific. And he thought that this was going to be uh, his next great project. Um, the, the Northern Pacific, which was to extend from the Great Lakes uh, to the Pacific coast um, of Washington and Oregon, um, was supposed to be the, the second transcontinental. It was supposed to be the Centennial Line, completed by 1876 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the nation. Uh, Cook uh, started to raise money for the railroad. It was a terrible, terrible decision that none of his friends could believe that he had made. Uh, railroads are terrible investments. Uh, they were so in the 19th century, uh, and because you have to, in order to make money off of it, you have to be able to sell the land that the track is going through. But in order to get the land from the federal government to sell, you have to build track. So how do you build the track? Where do you get the money to build the track? Uh, well, Cook started to loan the railroad money because he couldn't raise enough money through bond sales. He started to loan uh, the money from his own investment bank. So his own investors were paying for the Northern Pacific. Uh, and ultimately, that was an unsustainable situation. Uh, and Jay Cook and Company folded in September of 1873, which drove the whole country into a panic and depression. Um, he was interested in Yellowstone because he thought that he could uh, bring tourists to Yellowstone because the track was going to run about 50 miles north of the basin um, in, through what is now the town of Livingston, if you have been out there. Um, so this was his interest. He also was quite interested uh, and lobbied for the creation of the National Park. Um, but one of the reasons this did not go well, uh, not only were railroads not a good investment, but there was another man standing in his way, and that was Tatanka Iotake, uh, the Hunkapapa Lakota chief, whose lands extended from the Missouri River to the Yellowstone Basin. And he was really defending uh, this area from all white incursions during this period, including Cook's Railroad. And in three separate engagements, he actually successfully pushed the railroad surveyors and their U.S. Army protectors out of Lakota country. So he is the third protagonist of the book. Uh, he has an interest in keeping uh, the Yellowstone Basin and the Yellowstone River Valley for his people uh, and other indigenous polities, uh, because of course the Lakota were not the only ones uh, who were active in this uh, region and who used uh, Yellowstone as a thoroughfare or a ceremonial site um, or a place you know, to hunt bison and elk. Uh, these are just some of the indigenous uh, nations that have a historic tie to Yellowstone. There are actually 27 tribal nations that the National Park Service recognizes as having a tie to Yellowstone and is trying to 
integrate into uh, the history of the park. Uh, they just really started recently on that project, which is, is quite interesting and I think a much needed um, addition to the history and the experience of the park um, you know, at this kind of late date. But uh, there are active uh, groups that are coming in and inserting the indigenous history of Yellowstone into that tourist experience now. And so ultimately, um, in this book, I'm really trying to understand what we learn uh, when, we look at when we look at Yellowstone in the context of Reconstruction and when we look at Reconstruction in the context of Yellowstone. And so a major argument of the book uh, is that Reconstruction was, in fact, about uh, the North and the South and about bringing the South back into the nation. Um, but it was also about the West. Um, and bringing that region into the nation um, in a more firm way. And the Yellowstone Act was part of that process. Uh, and so really, I think what the book shows, not only in kind of telling you a really good story about three really fascinating people um, and their interest in this iconic American landscape, it's really showing us that Reconstruction, more than we've ever thought of before, is really a national story. So I'll stop there so that Vaughn and I have time to talk, but thank you very much. that you're excited to get back to Yellowstone. What was your experience like going back to Yellowstone after writing this book and being cooped up while you were writing it? <laughs> yeah, that, you know, I, I was so bummed. I, I had two trips to Yellowstone on my calendar uh, for May and September uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. And Yellowstone is one of the, the few national parks that actually has its own library and archives. Um, and so I was excited to get in there, and they actually have some of those Moran watercolors. I was going to see them in person, and I didn't get to go uh, at all. And so I went in September 2021. The book was already in production. It was in copy edits. <laughs> yep. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and luckily for me, it was not yet in page proofs because um, when I actually went back, you know, it had been four. Years, yeah, almost that's, 40 years exactly since I had been to the park. And of course I had seen all the photographs and I had used all the photographs to help me and maps, current maps and also the, the Hayden Expedition maps to sort of orient myself. I'd like to put you as readers kind of down on the ground next to these people. And so knowing what the landscape is like is, is really important for me as a historian. Um, it was fascinating though because I, I realized when I went there that I had some details wrong. And, and I think when you're, when you haven't been there in a while and you don't have a full sense, like an, you know, either drone footage from above or any kind of video, it's hard to uh, really imagine that Yellowstone, first of all, is very high in elevation. It's up over 8,000 feet. Um, and to get into it, in most entrances, you're going up and over a big pass. Um, and there are mountains everywhere. And I think we think Yellowstone Basin, and you think of it as a volcanic sort of depression, like it's a big bowl, and it is not. And to get to, it has, the park has kind of four quadrants, and to get to any of them from the other, you have to actually go up over about 9,000 to 10,000 feet. Um, so a lot of the roads close uh, during inclement weather, um, and when we were there in September, it snowed on us. Um, and then when we were there in May again of this year, it snowed on us. Um, so there were, there were things that I just didn't, the, the description from the, the historical sources was not enough for me to really know. So that was, I mean, it's a little bit of a shock, right? Because as historians, I mean, you know you're not going to get everything right. But, but when you realize you got something really wrong, you're like, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> like, this isn't good, right? Um, but I did have time to change. So that was really, really good. But I will say that instead of kind of looking at a map um, in the shotgun seat, like my husband was driving when we were on this trip, and I was drawing 
a map for myself so that I could then look back at my manuscript and like <laughs> figure out where things were. Um, and just as one little detail, I have not realized just from reading about it, Mammoth Hot Springs is a major point for Hayden because this is, uh, to him, his most important finding because um, previous expeditions had not been there, it had not yet been fully described um, for Americans. And so he saw this as his real, the place where he was really making his mark. And when he describes going up there, they turn away from the Gardner River, and he just says they rode uphill. And I didn't realize that hill's like a thousand feet high, right? So this is the Gardner Road. If you've been in the northern entrance, you kind of wind along the Gardner River, and then you just start doing these switchbacks up the side, and you don't see Mammoth until you come over the top. So it's really actually quite easy to miss. So being there really helped me understand why people had missed it, before, if they were just following the river. Um, but also that experience, like their horses were really gasping for breath by the time they got up to that plateau uh, where Mammoth is now. Um, yeah. And didn't they, have, didn't they have 100 horses? Something like that? They, they had a lot of horses. Okay, they had about 50 horses. Because okay, yeah. they, they, there were about 50 of them. Okay. Uh, so they were riding horses, and then they also had uh, horses and mules that were uh, they had no wagons because at that point there were only pathways into the park and so they weren't wide enough for wagons. But they had their, all of their supplies strapped to other horses. Yes, uh, yes. so they, they, they were riding some and then they had the others that were pack animals uh, and they had to pack them up basically every day and pack specimens onto their backs that they were then gonna mail back uh, to the Smithsonian. So they had a lot of extra horses. Once they got into the park, there was no, I mean, they had to deal with what they had. Yes. Um, because there was no one like, that was gonna supply them. Um, and it, it was not the park then, of course. Once they got into Yellowstone Basin. Um, but yeah, they have a lot of animals with them. And you know, it's something I reflect a lot on um, re as I was reading this. It was such an age of, you know, we talk about age of exploration. Of course, there are already people living there. They're na Native yes. American peoples. But um, for, you know, white Americans, this would have been, we don't really have anything quite like this anymore, where we're going into this, these fantastical, strange places. Um, as you were reading their diaries and their journals, was there anything that really left? I mean, an example that comes to my mind is when they experienced their first earthquake. Like that camp, for many of them, had never felt an earthquake before. So it's, all these things are always happening that's, that are destabilizing them. What, did they? Did any of them, I know, like struggle? I know later on one of them, someone commits suicide, but did any of them at the time reflect, did they talk about really struggling like with experiencing all these new things? Was it all just awe and wonder? Did any of them kind of feel overwhelmed ever? I think some of them did feel a little overwhelmed at certain points and, and one, of, one of the cavalry uh, escorts, because they had a, they had a couple of soldiers from Fort Ellis who they picked up as, as protective detail. And he, <laughs> and, and if you're ever a tourist in Yellowstone and you're more than, there for more than a couple of days, you, you may feel this uh, along with, with him, but he was just like, you know what, I've seen a lot of geysers. Like I'm kind of, and he, and he didn't say like I'm over it, but that was, that was kind of the, the thing. He was kind of like, oh God, more? Like they're really, oh, okay. You know, because he was, you know, of course all the scientists are busy collecting specimens and they're very interested, particularly in the geothermal field, because that's really the part of the park, even though, you know, the, um, the waterfalls are amazing and Yellowstone Lake is amazing, but you have waterfalls and mountain ranges and lakes and other parts of the country, right? They're, they're not as spectacular. The geothermal field though, like Hayden knew, almost immediately once he saw the upper and the lower geyser basin that this was not only the largest probably in the world, which it is, um, but also unique in all the world, which it is. And so that was really the impetus when, when he was lobbying for the Yellowstone Act, it was that part of what we now know of as the park that was the core of the preservation. But that part of the park also was extremely dangerous. I mean, you saw a Moran like out there clambering on the on Mammoth Hot Springs. If he had fallen in, he would have been basically burned to death and dissolved. Um, and and people die every year at Yellowstone now 
falling because they go off the paths and they fall, they break through the crust and they fall into, into springs and it's really gruesome. Um, and so there was that sort of sense of danger, like when they put their ear to the ground, they could hear the water boiling underneath, right? And their horses' hooves were like echoing. They could hear that there was nothing underneath their feet and that really freaked them out. Um, and in the book, I kind of use this not only as a, as a sign that you know, this is a unique space and kind of a terrifying space, as all sublime landscapes are kind of terrifying, um, but also that it became a metaphor for the nation, right? That you have this kind of surface that is showing the tension underneath, but really you have no idea what's going on under there and how it could, and that's the earthquake too, you know, they, there was no way for them to anticipate um, the kind of violence that would have like suddenly emerge, right? Um, and for me, I was writing that portion of the book like in January 2021, like as the gen as the insurrection was going on and the aftermath of that. And so that became very clear to me. I was like, well, the, you know, then as now, right there, there are hidden currents uh, that suddenly come to the fore in this in this huge amount of violence. Um, and that seems to be a perfect metaphor for America. Yeah, that's, I had a note in here that, that you end your book with the Yellowstone, like America's both fragile and powerful, and what lies beneath the surface in this nation is always threatening to explode. So I think that was, yeah. And, and I think that's also interesting in that, you know, you're writing this book cooped up at home like we all were. And what, did it kind of provide you an escape in some ways? It did, yeah. it did actually. I was able to immerse myself in Yellowstone in that part of the book. The kind of first part of the book is about, a lot of it is about the expedition and about the Humpapa Lakota and their kind of, um, you know, positioning themselves within their homeland um, at this moment also. The second half of the book is more DC um, and the fight over the Yellowstone Act because it was not unanimous. You know, we tend to think of yeah yeah we tend to think of national parks now as oh well of course they're amazing why wouldn't anyone want this um, but you know eighty nine percent of Republicans voted for the Yellowstone Act and you know as as I think most people know now the the parties were flipped in this period um, in terms of their ideologies and their platforms uh, than what we know today. And so 89% of Republicans voted for the Yellowstone Act, 70% of Democrats voted against it. So it was not unanimous. Um, and, and they basically were fighting over federal overreach and the, the idea that you know, taking these lands out of production violated white settler rights. You know, and that right to take up land Wherever you wanted to and develop it how you wanted to was the core of manifest destiny, was the core of the American dream. And so even some moderate Democrats were a little worried about that and voted against the Yellowstone Act um, because of that. So, and these, these objections are still with us today. Yeah, I was gonna mention that too because there's so much federal and you know, protected land out west and it's still causing People still get upset about it. Um, I was also interested to see that some people, when they're debating it, did indeed bring up the rights of Native American peoples too, which was very, I mean, they were of course, the, but that kind of transitions. I really loved your parts about Sitting Bull, um, and I was really impressed with how you, you use Native American terms for so many things that we just take for granted, like, oh, well, no, they have their own. How, do you, how are you able to do that with accuracy? And I saw in your acknowledgments that you mentioned some people helped you with that. Any book, of course, is a, it's not just a lone endeavor, but how, how did you go about doing that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I am not Native, and so whenever um, a non-Native scholar is doing Native history, I think the, the most important thing to do is to be respectful of Native sources. You know, anything that comes to us, um, oral histories, any kind of histories, um, material culture, um, is coming to us because Native peoples have allowed us to see it, right? Um, and so much of their, their history has been misappropriated and misrepresented, it, you know, particularly in the early 19th century by anthropologists. And so, um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of uh, hesitation uh, among uh, Native groups in, in sharing some of their histories. And so, in the book, I was always um, 
very careful to privilege native sources that had, had come to us that had been published. Um, and uh, the Lakota peoples have actually built a website with all of their vocabulary. So it's a dictionary that you can use and you plug in certain terms. And sometimes, you know, if you don't really understand the way the language works, you know, like I'm, I'm not a linguist, so I, I, in some ways, my construction of, of particular terms using that dictionary uh, was, uh, you know, was a little clunky. And so I, um, I asked a colleague who's a professor of Rutgers, Jameson Sweet, who is Lakota to Dakota. Um, I hired him to read the manuscript fully and to give me some help on the language. Um, and so he did, and it was wonderful because he, he really, really helped me uh, to figure out uh, what names would have been and why. And um, I, I wanted, again, because I want readers to really have a sense of the lived experience on the ground, uh, and so when you're with Sitting Bull, I wanted you to be able to kind of know the language you would have been using. Um, and so some of the terms kind of stay in Lakota the whole way through. Um, other times I just kind of note the, the translation or what the, what the name would have been um, once and then any, any further references are in English. But um, I do, I think it's important when you are writing Native history to respect that language and respect those sources. Yeah, I think you did a great job of that. That's one of the things that really leapt out at me and, you know, just reflecting upon that and thinking about Native American people's histories and how they, they just, they're privileging us, allowing us to see that because so much of it hasn't even misappropriated. Um, with the political boys, uh, I feel like they could have a own like a great mini series or something <laughs> with them, you know, like their perspective. Did they get into like trouble and stuff? Were they off? Did they ever like sneak into some whiskey or something like that? Well, yes. Yeah. So, so Hayden did have whiskey with him, uh, and they everyone was allowed to have it. He didn't really restrain people along those lines, and that's part of the reason they loved him is that. Uh, and, and they were quite rowdy, and the, the reason we know this is because um, Hayden brought one of his former professors along, uh, George Allen, who was a botanist, uh, who had never ridden a horse before, uh, and so he was, he was hurting by the time, you know, and he actually had to, had to leave the expedition because his health was just terrible before they actually went into uh, Yellowstone Basin. So he was a little upset about that, but he had not been to any part of the West before. So he had seen Salt Lake and he had you know, been with the expedition as it moved north from Salt Lake up uh, into Idaho and then um, up to Bozeman and that's where he left. But he was constantly complaining about the political boys and how rowdy they were and you know, I tried to understand like, oh, they're young. You know, um, well, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. It was a great adventure for them. Yes. I mean, to, uh, I couldn't imagine. How old were they, like 18? Yeah, they were, they were kind of 18 and 19, and then Hayden also had some of his former students at the University of Pennsylvania with him. So Albert Peel, who is a major figure, he's a mm -hmm. mineralogist, and he comes along, he writes this amazing journal that I used a lot as a source in the book. You know, he's only 22, 23. Um, so th these are a lot of young guys, and Hayden is not all that young. He's in his early 40s um, at this time. So this is, I was joking initially, I mean, this is the three major protagonists, you know, are all men, uh, and they're all middle-aged men. <laughs> so I was like, you know, these are guys who are kind of at the full height of their power um, at this moment. They've established themselves, they have a reputation. Uh, the one who was probably most powerful was Sitting Bull um, in his particular context. Um, but yeah, and Sitting Bull was the youngest. He was in his, his mid to late thirties. Um, but you know, Hayden was in his forties, and Cook was in his fifties. But all of these other guys on the expedition were really young, and um, and so they were a little rowdy. But again, Hayden just said to them, you know, you can do what you want, but you're going to have to work. Yes. So they collected, like they acted as assistants uh, to a lot of the scientists on the expedition, and they went out collecting and. Hayden was very savvy uh, where this, you know, came in because he actually, in his report of the expedition, lists uh, several of those political boys in the, the introduction table of contents as co-collectors with the various scientists. So, you know, 
It, it, it helped him. It helped yeah. him that he had Chester Dawes along with him, who was uh, the son of, of Henry Dawes, yes. the very powerful Massachusetts uh, senator who would then go on to author the Dawes Act mm -hmm. of 1887. Um, and Dawes was a huge proponent of, of Hayden's surveys and the Yellowstone Act and argued for it. And in fact, when um, uh, another member of Congress kind of brought up Lakota land rights, like did the Lakota have uh, any property rights in this area? And if so, they were going to have to look at the treaty. And Henry Dawes, yeah. true to himself, was just like, whatever. Yeah. Like no one, I mean, they can't live there, right? Yeah. So, yeah. He's like, that's ridiculous. Why? Like nobody, they don't live there. And in any case, they would have just extinguished any. And any in what they called Indian titles uh, in order to get that done, because that's what they did for all the railroads. But yeah, so Chester Dawes also showed up in several of Jackson's photographs. So this was also, you know, they were documenting these boys because they were powerful and they were gonna go home to their fathers and say, oh, look what I did, I had this great trip and I did all this work and I learned some things and, and they were then evidence in and of themselves. Yeah, and this book's such a poignant reminder of something I, you know, Something we see as such a positive, you know, national parks, state parks. They they were native land. We we're all living on native lands at all times. And you know, this is something that is gaining steam right now a lot in our fields of like recognizing these are native lands, people were here before us. Um, and you know, something that that we see often from an American perspective is this blank positive for native people. I mean Sidney Bull spending the entire his entire book, he's trying to learn how to ward off these invaders. I really love the scene that you paint when he sits down during that battle when they're challenging his, some of his younger warriors are challenging him and he just sits there and smokes a pipe. And they're all like, oh my God. Like he, what was it like when you first read about that passage? Was that, I mean? This is such an interesting moment for Sitting Bull. I mean, I was really interested, mostly I think we know him, right, from um, Battle of Little Bighorn, mm -hmm. right? He just kind of emerges. Um, as a leader in that battle. But really, he had started cementing his leadership in the 1860s, and he started to come to the attention of a lot of federal employees um, and territorial employees in, the, in this moment, in the late 1860s and early 1870s. Um, when you do a word search in all the congressional documents and you put in Sitting Bull, he just starts you know, you'll see some mention of him and then he just starts proliferating like in this moment because and he is causing a lot of trouble um yeah and he in in all of these battles um you know he again is in his late 30s he's established himself but he's also getting some pushback mm -hmm. from some of the the younger men who are trying to really establish their reputation as war leaders uh and he doesn't you know the all indigenous peoples and, and the Lakota in particular are pretty conservative in their warfare style. Mm -hmm. They're never going to attack a force that is larger than theirs, um, where they do not have the high ground. Uh, and in most cases, um, the one weapon that Native peoples did not have, uh, that American armies did have, uh, were cannons. And so whenever they saw a cannon being dragged along behind a group, usually uh, they would act, they would not initiate a full-on assault um, because they knew that the, the cannon was going to decimate them and so um, so they were very smart about it but in this in this particular battle um, at Arrow Creek you know the, the Lakota had just kind of run into these surveyors they didn't know they were out there um, they were on a different path they were going to go and make war on the crow people who were their traditional enemies um, but they ran into them and, and they were trying to decide what to do when the young men just sort of went off and attacked them on their own and so, you know, Sitting Bull's like, oh, great. So then, then he had to kind of get into the battle. Uh, and he saw, kind of after a day of, of fighting, that they weren't going to win. And so he ordered a retreat. And the young men who were kind of under the influence of this other um, uh, elder named Long Holy, um, you know, they refused to go. And Long Holy actually said to Sitting Bull, like, well, why do you want to retreat? It seems like maybe you're not brave. You aren't as brave as you were. And so... <laughs> Sitting Bull just gets off his horse, and they were up on a, on a kind of bluff, and the, the soldiers were down over here. And so he walked down, halfway down the bluff, and just sat there and smoked a pipe. And the, you know, the US soldiers were trying to shoot him, and, he, and I, I'm not sure if they actually knew it was him. I'm not sure that they knew it was actually Sitting Bull, but here's this 
you know, here's this Lakota warrior just kind of sitting there. So they start trying to shoot him, and then all the bullets are hitting all around him. They can't quite get him. And he just calmly smokes his pipe, and, and a couple of guys came and sat next to him. And he passed the pipe along, and then they're all sitting there kind of nervous. And, uh, and he just calmly cleans the pipe out, and then he's like, all right, let's go. And the young men, you know, run back up uh, the hill, and he just kind of walks back up to his horse. And then he said, you know, we're retreating, and then everyone it's, followed, it's, right? It's an incredible yeah. moment, um, and it gives you this real insight of who he was. Yes. I mean, so unfortunately, to wrap this up, my last question for you, though, I keep doing that, is what's your next book? I tried to ask her this before, and she's like, how about we save this for So what's your next project? Yes, so, um, you know, as usual, whenever I uh, am nearing the end of one book project, I start to think about the next one. I'm not one of those writers. I wish I were. I don't know if you are, like, someone who has a list of, like, 15 book ideas that they want. Yeah, I, the, I don't have that. I wish I did. I really wish I did. Um, but uh, so as I was finishing Saving Yellowstone, um, you know, I was thinking about next projects. I was thinking about um, kind of big questions that were in the air. And uh, David McCullough's The Pioneers came out. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was his last book, and, I, and it, it's sort of, you know, not great that yeah. it was, because that, that book has a lot of problems with it. And so, uh, and a lot of historians kind of went, went after it uh, in print, um, because it really upholds the pioneer myth of American history, and so I was like, well, what if I wrote a book that would be called The Westerners, mm -hmm. that where the main question would be, or the main, it, some of the main questions would be, what if we thought about the people who built the West, not as pioneers, but as Westerners, um, not as kind of white families moving from east to west in Calistoga wagons along the Oregon Trail, but people from all different communities moving in all different directions through the West during the 19th century, so from the the south to the north, uh, from the west to the east, um, from the north to the south. Uh, so that book um, I'm currently researching and writing. Uh, it also has nine protagonists, So, but a much broader, this is the first time I've ever done a whole century <laughs> worth of history. Uh, most of my other books have been a little more tightly focused, uh, but it is fun. And right now I'm writing part one, uh, which pairs uh, two women together. So I get to write about women, which is very exciting. Four of the nine uh, protagonists are women. Um, and one is uh, Sakakawea, who is, we know more often as Sakakawea. Um, and the other is a woman named Maria Gertrudis Barcelo, who uh, migrated to Santa Fe from Sonora, Mexico uh, in the 1830s. And uh, by the time Carney's troops came through for the Mexican-American War to take Santa Fe, she was the wealthiest woman in all of New Mexico territory uh, because she owned a gambling saloon. Uh, and she was a, a dealer of a card game they call Spanish Monte. Um, so those two women are, are in the first kind of pair in the book and they're really, uh, I'm, through them I'm talking about not only women in these societies who had a lot more freedom than I think we tend to think of, but who are also cultural brokers, and that many Westerners kind of were cultural brokers, that they spoke multiple languages, they were constantly moving through the landscape, they were um, you know, creating alliances in order to survive and build the region. Sounds fascinating. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, and thank you all for coming out today. And I make this book. It's really good. <laughs> okay. Thanks, you guys.